Hello, everybody, and welcome all thanks to LB Mobile. This is NBL Overtime. Plenty to get into. Hashtag NBL Overtime to get involved. Liam, Corey, hello. Cam, good to be back. What's going on? I'll tell you what's going on. I'm going to get to you shortly. Done a lot of Wikipedia stuff lately, but we are joined off the top by a very special guest. A man that's got homicide excited about the makeup of his team. So excited that he's got his own blueprint. We'll get to that very shortly. I talk <laughs> with the owner, the CEO of the New Zealand Breakers, Matt Walsh. G'day, buddy. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. Anytime. Before we really let homicide loose on you, how's it been? You've been in a little bit lockdown, full lockdown in New Zealand, a little bit different to hear how we are in Australia. How's it been the last couple of months? Yeah, it's been, I mean, I think we're very fortunate, me and my family, to be here uh, compared to what's going on in the States and everywhere else, basically around the world. Very fortunate to be here in New Zealand, live close to the beach, so lots of walks on the beach and getting outdoors and really just tried to enjoy a bunch of time with my family and now excited to get back to business. My yeah. turn? Yeah, your turn. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I got you guys picked right now to get to the grand finals. Here's my reason. The five players you re-signed. I think with how the season ended, they just got hungrier. They gelled together. The camaraderie's there on and off court. And it took Dan Shamir a season, who's a hell of a coach, to really understand how this league works. I believe if you get 0-2, Ty Webster, because of the border restrictions, and sign Scotty Hobson, you get into the grand final. And that's the team I'm predicting to win the championship. How close are you to making these things happen? <laughs> well, we're doing our best. Um, obviously, uh, we've made it very clear our biggest priority since the season ended was getting Scotty Hobson back. I think, uh, you know, since he was healthy second half of the year, we were the best team in the league. He was the best player in the league. Obviously, everyone knows about the buzzer beaters. He was clutch. Uh, but on top of that, he was the most professional guy, amazing guy in the community. We really want him back. The other guys, Ty Webster, Isaac Fotu, obviously very high-level international players. They've been playing in Italy and Turkey the last few years. Um, we've had discussions with them. They're going to be coming through our program here in the offseason, working out with our guys. We're going to start some pickup runs here. And, you know, we're going to use that basically as a platform to showcase who we are as an organization. Um, obviously, it helps that these guys play national team together. So Tom Abercrombie, Corey Webster, Finn Delaney, Rob Lowe, we're using them uh, as a recruitment tool. And like you said, I think we're in really good shape. We're fortunate we've got five guys back from last year's team. And everyone you mentioned we'd love to see in a Breakers uniform next year. What do you think needs to fall in place, Matt, to get each of those guys? Well, obviously, the, I think the things to, to fall in place for Webster and, and Foto are probably different for Hop, but what, what do you think will be the things that might get that done? Yeah, sure. I mean, Hop, I think he's going to wait a little bit. He's going to see what happens with the NBA season, see if the G League comes back. Um, I think, you know, I've been very well documented. I think Hop's an NBA player. Um, just based on circumstance and situation. So I think there's a decent chance we can see him in an NBA uniform next year. And if not, we're going to do everything we can to get him in a Breakers uniform. So that one's just going to take a little bit of time. We're working as hard as we can on it. With Ty and Isaac, look, those guys, uh, especially and Italy last year, very high-level leagues. Ty was playing uh, Galatasaray, one of the best teams globally. Um, for them, it's going to depend on – the international markets, obviously everyone knows with coronavirus, we don't know what's going to happen in Italy or Turkey or EuroLeague or Euro Cup. I think we're fortunate in Australia and New Zealand that we're going to be one of the first leagues back to business. And I'm just hoping that they're loving New Zealand like I am, that they're really enjoying being home. They're having some good home cooked meals and we can leverage all that, you know, mom and grandma's cooking to, to get them to stick around. Cam, okay, I just want to jump back onto that real quick because um, I think part of the mix of trying to sign these guys is is part of that is the salary agreement between the league and the Players Association. This is our first chance to have an owner on to, to ask the questions that I think the viewer wants to hear, which is why was the, the that why was that agreement necessary? Yeah, I think that no matter what happens, it's very unlikely that revenues around the league. Um, are going to be like last year. I don't see any scenario, unfortunately, where 
15,000 people are going to be able to see a game in Sydney or 9,000 people are going to be able to come to Spark Arena. I hope I'm wrong. I hope that we're back 100% in business. But I think more likely than not, this season, we're going to have to find a way to play in front of a quarter filled stadiums or limited fans. And I think that's just the reality of that coronavirus has put us in. And just like a lot of other professional sporting leagues in the world, when revenues are down, we just have to bear some of that reality you know from an owner's perspective from a team perspective uh you know if we're putting out salaries that are normal but our revenues are cut in half it's going to put the long-term quality and everything of the league in jeopardy so uh it was from what i understand it was very honest conversations between the league and the players association they explained all that and from my conversations with our reps uh they understood that and it was very important to our guys, Tom Abercrombie, Jared Weeks, and the rest of our players, that they were not the only ones taken care of, but also our staff here. And it's been great for us. We've maintained a full staff with the Breakers. We're trying to get through this all together. You know, since our ownership group came in, we spent a lot of time building this staff and getting the right people in place. And it was important for the players and for me to, to get through this all together. So we're doing our best to do that. When you look back on NBL 20, and you mentioned that you were probably the best team or playing the best basketball going into the playoffs, you fell out a little bit short. We'll get to your t shirt in a moment and probably get to what tier. Obviously, Homicide's got your tier one this year compared to this time last year. But what do you look back on an NBL 20? Do you look back at it and a little bit of regret and disappointment because you were playing the best? Do you look back on it and use it as a positive because the building blocks you just spoke of, headlined by Dan Chimera, are probably going to allow you the opportunity to bring some of these other guys back in and and work with those contracts you sign. How do you, how do you view as yourself individually in BL20 from a team perspective? Yeah, I think when you're the breakers, and this is something that was built over 15 years long before I got here, the expectation is you compete for a championship or it's a disappointing season. And I think, uh, you know, I'm fortunate I played professionally for 10 years. I've been through some really good years, some really bad years. I never went through a year like this where there was so many injuries and things that just felt at times like everything was going wrong. I mean, we lost a beloved member of our family here in Patalatoa. We, you know, we signed Glenn Rice, who had two legal issues in two weeks. We had a lot of stuff that went, felt like bad in the second half of the year, but we stuck with it so strong. I think it speaks to the character of our key guys, Tom Abercrombie, Corey Webster, Finn Delaney, you know, all these local guys who they're the best guys in the world, really. Like Tom Abercrombie's the best leader I've ever been around, the best captain I've ever been around from a professional standpoint. And they totally bought in the Dan Shamir and Modi and what we were building here. And it took some time, you know, like Homicide said, I don't think it was so much of learning the league. I think it was, we had no preseason. Guys got back from the World Cup late. We went on an NBA tour. We were missing three starters to start the season. And by the time we were able to get healthy, it was just a little bit too late. And you know, a lot of people wanted um, me to come out and talk when the Brisbane beat the Cairns by 35 points. And I had a conversation with Dan Shamir and his, his reaction was, we should have won one more game. And then we're not having that discussion. And, you know, from a leadership side of the basketball things, I'm very proud that that was his reaction. I'm very proud of the team. And like I said, we'll build on it for this year and hopefully we'll compete for a championship. And that's a great reaction after the game and the best way to handle it. But what were your emotions while the game was going on? You know, it was funny. I didn't even watch the first 35 minutes of the game. And then I got a text. Somebody texted me like, can you believe this or something? And I knew right away. I was like, ah, okay. So I put it on. I watched the end. I mean, just from my perspective, I was, it was more the guys who are the end, end of the bench guys for Cairns shouldn't determine a whole season. And it ended up not mattering, right? Because Melbourne just won yep. and they just to be in. But I just, my reaction was we need to figure something out as a league so that DPs and guys who haven't played together all year are not determining the fate of teams that have played 28 games. So, I mean, I was pissed off. Like I said, I called Dan Schmier and he calmed me down quick. And that's what you want, uh, like I said, from a leader on the basketball side of things. Hey, we spoke about um, re-signing a few guys. One guy we didn't mention was Brandon Ashley. Um, you got an interest in bringing him back? Yeah, I mean, Brandon was great for us. Sack Henry, too. Uh, you know, once we were able to get healthy and get our kind of right lineup out there and we figured it out, and once, you know, we had big expectations for RJ Hampton, but he got hurt and it gave Sack a chance to come in and play his more traditional role of, you know, 30, 32 minutes at the point guard position, we were a totally different team. I mean, you look at Sack's numbers, second half of the year, the big shots he was able to make as a creator. Um, him and Brandon were amazing. And, uh, you know, I'm still hopeful that there's some path to having 
this year. Uh, you know, we're going to review all that stuff with the Players Association in July. I'd love to keep the level of our league up and have the three imports. And um, we've had a lot of talk around here running it back with the same imports just because they were so good the second half of the year. And the biggest thing was they really playing with each other and the local guys love them and um, they were all very professional. So we'd love to have them all back in a perfect world. Talk to me about, talk to us about RJ Hampton, his development and where do you see him in his future in the NBA? Yeah, I think RJ is going to be a top 10 pick. I truly believe that I'm very, I hope for his sake that he's able to, get some pre-draft workouts in because I think when he's able to play against the college guys, it's going to be night and day, night and day in terms of just his development. I mean, he was playing against people don't realize all the point guards in our leagues are, are in our league are either former NBA players or borderline NBA players. And he was going up against them and holding his own in a lot of ways. We knew coming in that it was going to be a development process, that there was going to be some really high highs. Like when we beat Illawarra here and he had the block and the dunk and, and there was going to be some lows like in Southeast Melbourne when he let the motions get the best of him. But RJ's a very hard worker. I think he's got the physical tools to be a player that sticks in the NBA for 12 or 13 years. And I think he's only going to get better. Um, looking at him on Instagram and the videos that he sends us, his body's already gotten much better. Um, and from my conversations with NBA scouts, I think it's unanimous that he's a top 10 pick. And, or, you know, in that range, top 10 lottery. And I'm looking forward to watching his development. And it'll be a cool thing to be a part of. Given your keen eye for talent and your NBA experience, who has the better NBA career as a whole, RJ Hampton or LaMelo Ball? You can throw all that stuff you said out the window. I'm telling you RJ because he's my guy. Because, <laughs> because he's I'm just buttering you up. <laughs> you forgot politician. I'm also a politician. So. <laughs> All right, hashtag NBA over time to get involved. What's a t-shirt you're sporting there, mate? Yeah, this is a uh, this is a new Gucci shirt that's coming out here. Oh, you got its face on it. <laughs> get a good look. Yeah, oh, man, a good look. To, for those who don't know, we made a bet, me and Liam, preseason whether we would make the finals, and we weren't able to do it. And I wasn't able to go and watch a game. I was supposed to sit courtside at a finals game with this shirt on, but because of the coronavirus, I wasn't able to travel. So I'm a man of my word. Yeah, I'll you're a good it. man. I wanted to give everyone a little preview. I felt like it was the right time. Appreciate I, that. I actually wanted to have a little behind the scenes footage NBL overtime that we're going to add in sort of Liam and his wife discussing the budget issues that he was going to have to have <laughs> jumping on a plane and going to New Zealand. Now, I believe those conversations and negotiations had happened, yeah. but didn't have to end up come to fruition. Yeah, no, we, we had the conversation because, man, as Corey said, and, and Matt spoke about it before, that, that, that team was storming home. Absolutely storming home. And, um, yeah, if, uh, like you said, you're one, basically one win off, off taking that spot. So, I mean, it's good of you to wear the T-shirt. In essence, I mean, I was right that you didn't make the finals, but I was <laughs> wrong with how your season played out because, you know, you guys were well and truly right there and have you know set some great foundations to build on speaking of building on foundations um not only did you do that on the floor with that group but you had massive crowds in there last year setting records for the franchise the obviously the COVID situation and, and the uncertainty of all that i mean how do you go about trying to build on that momentum in this environment yeah we we're fortunate i mean and it was a lot of fun. And if you talk to any of our home games during the second half of the year, this year, I mean, the first half was great. We had the LaMelo games. But by the end of the year, when we were cruising as a team, it felt like you were in a club or something. It was so much fun. Yeah. Um, and I think we really got our game night right. We have to take a step back now and see what that means with coronavirus and how we're going to do the fans for this year. But I think we've got great – we're a known now in the – We'll find, you know, we'll find a way, even if it means, uh, you know, constructing some port side and making the experience a little bit. Everyone around the world's in this position. Everyone's got to try and figure it out. We're, and, um, we'll figure it out. <laughs> and lastly, mate, before we let you go, of course, everyone's sort of searching for some content, in particular social media-wise, and, and how to keep people engaged. I did see the University of Florida, the Gators, last week, or maybe the week before, going back to throw back <laughs> photos. I forgot that big wig you were running and a little bit of bleach back in those mid-2000s, man. Any chance of bringing that back? Yeah. 
Well, first of all, no bleach. That was the natural color. That was but natural. I can't, I can't grow it anymore. Trust me. If I could, <laughs> I'd have the curls out right now. I'm going the other way, unfortunately. Uh, that's why. That's why I got the hat on. <laughs> hey, mate. We appreciate your time jumping in, and uh, of course. Uh, interesting times, but no doubt the conversation of which you, you spoke about that all New Zealand lineup a couple of months ago has got a lot of us, in particular, homicide excited. So looking forward to our plays out in uncertain times. And uh, as Liam touched on, as we've all seen, both yeah, on and you. off the court, breakers continue to build, mate. Good luck with it. And we'll talk soon. Cool. Thanks, guys. Stay safe, OK? Yeah, a few formalities on uh, entry into the gym today. Uh, we uh, came through the front entrance, which we usually use the side entrance, and uh, upon coming through, uh, we had our temperature taken. We were uh, we got the um, had our hands washed, and then uh, we came on through. And we had a questionnaire to fill out as well. So yeah, no, it was uh, very formal, um, but safe, which is uh, most important to make sure the players are healthy. Today, um, we can only do individual sessions, no contact, one coach, one player. Um, so lots of shots up. Uh, and a little bit of work on the lungs for the guys. Uh, you know, they have been doing their work back in their in their homes and in their backyards and front yards and and whatnot. But uh, you know, once you get a basketball in your hands, the the, the activity is a little bit different. So um, just easing the guys back in a little bit today. It's um, you know medical screenings like sanitising, you know sprays and stuff on shoes and hands and phones and keys and sharing, um, you know right before and right when you get home to try and minimise bacteria and you know washing the balls mid practice, like all these things you have to do. Um, you know, obviously very different, but in trying times, you have to do different things to try and get through. And I thought we did a great job today. Yeah, a big thing for us today is, as, a, as I said, is, is the sanitization of the basketballs, having our own basketballs now. So I've been asking for a basketball from coach for a few, you know, a few months now, and I finally got one. It's got my name on it. And as I said, we, we sanitize them. Um, Luke Kendall was my coach today. We all had separate ends. So um, I didn't have to worry about any of Gibbo's misses kind of getting in my way. Uh, none of Kyle's missed floaters were, were banging into my ball either. So, uh, you know, different times, um, you know, different training strategies, but at the same time, we get to be here together and, and all have fun. <laughs> there it is. Matt Walsh, of course, mentioned it just then that informal scrimmages, some of the boys are going to get back on court, including obviously the New Zealand based overseas players. And we did see a little Southeast Melbourne Phoenix hitting a court. I, I don't want to talk about Mitch Creeks working on his mid range jumper. I want to hear about Gibbo and his foul shots. Dane Pino had a breakout <laughs> NBL 20, has gone. When athletes feel good about themselves and they start to be a bit daring, that's where I see Dane Pino. And good luck to him because he deserves it. But that took me by surprise when the Phoenix social media crew posted the videos and, and some of the pictures in the last 24 hours. Yeah, we, uh, we spoke recently and the NBL ran uh, some, some stuff about some crazy hairstyles. And I think he's trying to get involved because that is an interesting look. Well... Obviously, Homicide, you're the NBL overtime hairdresser, dude, from the way that you used to roll your styles back in the day. What do you make of it? Will you give it a score out of 10? Yeah, I'll give it about an 8, 8.5. <laughs> but it's definitely up there. <laughs> Good to see him back on the floor, though. Hey, Definitely. Taking all the necessary precautions and the like, and we're just going to start to see more and more of that around the league. And I think, like the three of us and, and people watching right now with the easing of restrictions and the allowance just to do a little bit more and get outside of some type of new or at least normal life and for pro athletes it's going out and shooting some hoops uh, they posted the photos it's one ball per person so no one else is swapping basketballs and all the rest of it so to be able to go out and do what let's say Dane Pino for example would have been doing in the NBL one Mitch Creek might have been internationally somewhere be it the NBA or, or elsewhere there would be a situation right now where these guys would be on court doing what they love and to be able to do that is a small step towards feeling a little bit better about the situation we're all in. Yeah. And it's, it's an interesting situation because um, there's a lot of guys that are free agents mm -hmm. and the opening of free agency is a long, long way away. Yeah. So it's going to be interesting what team, you know, whether teams have in their gym guys that they anticipate signing or hope to re-sign or whether the, the option hasn't been taken. And for example, like I didn't see Ben Madgen or Dan Trist mm -hmm. in that footage yesterday. You know, where are those guys going to be working out over the next month or so? Hashtag NBL over time to get involved. A, a news story that sort of broke yesterday or in the last 48 hours, and it's relating to Luar Hawks. Now, for people like us, it might not have been overly slapping us in the face as anything greatly new, but there has been a little bit of media around the Luar Hawks going to liquidation. So Jeremy Low League, the commissioner, put out a statement. I'll read a little bit. Uh, the decision to liquidate the company that previously held the license to operate the Illawarra Hawk does not affect 
the future of the Illawarra Hawks participation in the NBL, nor does it affect the current process being conducted by the NBL to grant the license to operate the club to new owners as they have continually pushed. They continue to make sure to search with a couple of prospective groups, we believe, to find new ownership for the Hawks who continue as one of the foundation clubs. So while sometimes it gets, I'm not going to call it a beat up because this is how the media works in 2020, but the fact is when it's a liquidation doesn't, in essence, change what the NBL is trying to and will make sure they do going into NBL 21 and beyond. And that's all you got to worry about. At the end of the day, you know, moving forward is what's, what it's about right now. We all saw what happened and bring the collapse. I'm fortunate the situation that has happened. However, the NBL has got it covered and moving forward, Illawarra will be around for NBL 21 and in the future. Way past that. Yeah, I think, you know, if you haven't been following the story step mm-hmm. by step over the past month or so, like we said before, we've said before, if the, the words voluntary administration, yep. the word the club's going to be liquidated, you know, they're, they're kind of headline words. And if you're a journo around the traps and you've yep. thrown this story and, well, geez, the Hawks have been mm-hmm. placed in the liquidation, get on it. That's how you're going to frame it. You know, because you're not aware that this is part of the process of setting the club up to be taken over by new owners. And I think that the key words that came out of that statement from Jeremy Lowliger were, were the words well progressed. That obviously ongoing conversations mm-hmm. and discussions with these prospective owners. We are now well progressed towards finding the new owners for the franchise. And that's my understanding of the, of the conversations. And um, this is one step closer to that outcome. The good news, it kind of broke late Monday afternoon. We don't need to worry about it for about 45 minutes because the last dance came on, the last two episodes, and just quickly smashed it out of social media. So last dance, there was a hint of sadness, to be honest. I, I, I'm not sure if it was just because we've all been sitting around waiting for some type of sports content. We've seen the Bundesliga, we've seen the golf back on the weekend, so there's a small smattering. But the last dance has got us through. We sent you the last five weeks, and episodes nine and ten did not disappoint in Homicide. I, I, I need to ask you this firstly. I, I need to ask you something firstly off the top. While this particular player didn't play in the last season that ended in the sixth championship, he did play for one season as part of the first three-peat and he played the Chicago Bulls. I, of course, speak of a man named Corey Williams, who was a power forward, so slightly bigger than you. He averaged 2.3 points a game, collected a championship ring, bounced around, played some time at Minnesota, uh, and, of course, didn't have your pizzazz or your flair, judging by a small Wikipedia search that I did on him. Do you know the man? Have you ever been confused (laughs) by the man? Have you ever... (laughs) Are you you not related at all? He's not a second or third cousin? Not at all. We're not related at all. Um, He was a good player in college. He went to Oklahoma State, if I'm Mm -hmm. correct. True. Um, And, obviously, when you get to Chicago Bulls, you know, they're already star-studded and stacked very limited playing time for him but no i do not know that Corey williams Have Corey's ever... an actual a very common name yeah I, I can imagine it would be he's a son Corey williams jr so we don't want to get that mixed <laughs> up as well he's not that much older than you have you ever been ever have you ever been sort of confused for him not at all never not at all people know People didn't even know Corey Williams. People knew Homicide, so there was no, no confusion. No one's ever called I think you. the big question, Cam, is whether that's yeah. his, quote, government name. Well, this is true. <laughs> yeah. We don't know. <laughs> you know what? This is very, very true. You could have a very similar story to Elmahan. No, on the Wikipedia, it would have said. It would have yeah. said. It hey, Wikipedia tells all, <laughs> doesn't it, Corey? Wikipedia it tells it all. Uh, well, Liam, what would you make of it last night? Big Luke. Yeah. Big Luke, episode nine, the, you know, a minute or so in, the big left-hand throwdown yep. across the lane and the, the big bucket late to send it into overtime against the Jazz. It was nice to have some big Luke moments, even if we don't have him as a talking head. Um, overall, I think the one thing that I, that I will mostly remember, and maybe it's recency bias because it was right at the end of the, the docker, but it's Jordan's frustration at not having the opportunity to run it back and go for number mm-hmm. seven. You know, the competitor in him wanted to do that. The greatest of all time wanted to do it and it wasn't done. That just doesn't make any sense. And then, and then that... Yeah, well, on that, Liam, it wouldn't happen today. In any sport, anywhere. It's, it's like... I don't oh. know, it's, go on. I'll say this. 
we, we watch these kinds of things from the outside mm-hmm. and you forget that th- these are humans and involved with emotions and egos and relationships, right? So we think, well, it's crazy that he hasn't had that conversation with Jerry Ryan's thought. No, how, is, how is he saying, I've never actually had that conversation? That's mm-hmm. unbelievable. But this happens. Like around the NBL, there are coaches who are not on speaking basis with their CEOs. Mm-hmm. There are, you know, there are coaches who, are, who don't get along at all with their assistant coaches. Like, you don't know the, the intricacies of these relationships. Yeah. And a lot of time, ego gets in the way. I, and I, 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 Ryan's I, sitting there thinking, well, if MJ wants to have that conversation, mm-hmm. it can come to me. MJ's thinking, well, it can come to me. You know, but I think that's my big takeaway, the fact that that, that just wasn't able to happen despite the GOAT wanting to run it back. I agree that when you're in, like people, just because you play a sport with someone, people just assume that you're friends. And that's, that's like when you go to work. If you have more than 10 people in a workplace, not everyone gets along. It's the same thing in, mm. in pro sports. We manage so that with you, Cam, for example. No shit. I don't like either of you guys, but I just rock <laughs> up because I've got nothing else to do in quarantine. But what I will say is that normally money and winning outlasts everything else. So that's the only... It is remarkable that you hadn't seen the comments. Just on Luke Longley before I let you go, Homicide. I, with, with, with Michael Jordan, there's a whole generation, younger generation, who were probably in some ways unaware. Like I seen Trey Young tweeting last week that he was stunned at stuff that Michael Jordan had actually done. And I was like, are you kidding me? You're like, I just assumed it because you're in the NBA, you have some type of idea. But that's not how it is. And that's the thing that I am disappointed with Luke Longley because I think there's a whole generation of Australian basketball fans who are unaware as to how good this guy actually was and, mm-hmm. and how critical he was to the Bulls. Like in that last, he averaged 11 points in that last season. He was going up against some big boys. You know, he's obviously not part of the big three and, you know, and all the rest of that. But there's a whole generation of American of worldwide basketball fans right now who have a greater appreciation for Michael Jordan. Mm-hmm. And when it comes to Luke Longley, I think that we've missed, and I, we're not going to argue as to why he is or isn't in there, and it might have been a different reason for whatever. But the fact is, we hold a whole generation of Australian basketball fans who love Ben Simmons, who love Patty Mills, who love Andrew Bogut, who love Cam Barge and, and Lauren Jackson and, and all these wonderful players we have who are unaware as to how bloody good Luke Longley was and how critical he was to a team that was so successful. And that's what I think I look back at. Love the doc. A bit disappointed, and, and I get why Luke Longley may not want to speak to Australian media on it as well. Homicide, your thoughts on it? Oh, your thoughts are valid, both of yours. You know, how do you not run it back? Um, how is Luke Longley, who played such a huge role, and he started, did not hit, get into the dock? That's just unbelievable in itself. And how do all of these young players in the NBA today did not know the history, pure laziness. Unless you're a purist, you're not going back to do the research with due diligence. You're basing it off of what the masses say and think about who's the best player. You know, when guys get old and whoever's the the fresh guy, guys usually run to that guy when you don't know, you know, the history. So for them to watch this valuable, valuable history lesson in the last five weeks to have – Nothing but your full attention because there's nothing else to do. I mean, this doc could not have dropped at a, any better time. Mm-hmm. And these guys are rethinking, all of them, all of them are rethinking who's actually, you know, that debate. I don't even have to say because we know that debate. There is no debate. There is no debate. Yeah, I mean, th- this past month, has been a welcome reminder of that fact for a lot of people that, that there is no debate about that. We can debate second and third and fourth and Mount Rushmore and all of that, but, but MJ is standing atop everything. My favourite moment, though, from the last couple of episodes was Larry Bird's stoic facial expression. That was pure brilliance. I just it loved it because he's like, there's still time on the clock. Mm-hmm. It's a good shot. We're in the yeah. lead now but there's still time on the clock. The whole place is going absolutely nuts. And it just, it just kind of showed for me, it illustrated like that difference, but you know, the, and between, between good and great, between good and great, because Larry was himself a killer. And exactly. He per- Nothing and he new. He's perfectly- been in those things before. <laughs> time to time again. 
<laughs> See how excited he is right now? I yeah. tell you, I tell, I tell well, you, Larry is perfectly understood yeah. the situation. Time clocks, score, this guy, that guy, exactly. and and uh, and then that that back and forth. Savage from MJ. Larry just lost game seven of the conference finals, and he tells him to go work on his golf game. Which Larry probably did. <laughs> Two things that come out of it. We're going to get to a comparison. We spoke to Andrew Gaze last week and asked him some similar questions to Generation v Generation. There's a couple of documentaries that can come off this, I think. One is Pizzagate. Oh, I think someone's got to get to Utah and get to the bottom of how this all played out. Uh, remarkable story. Like, I don't know, there's five dudes rocking up to your door <laughs> already, as Tim Grover touched on. And I actually think... I heard something amazing about that, Cam. Oh, go on. I heard something amazing about that last night. I was listening to Jalen Jacoby talk to the Mm -hmm. director. And they're asking him about that. Like, come on, man. Like, it's 11 o'clock at night. There's four guys in a hotel room and a pizza arrives. There's no way one guy eats the whole lot. You know, we've all been in that type of situation. And, And the director said, well, actually, what was untold about that story was that um, the, everyone else in that room had eaten dinner earlier and they hadn't waited for MJ to order dinner. So he was pissed. So when that pizza arrived, the director said, he told them all, this is mine. No one touch it. And he spat on it. Yes. <laughs> MJ spat on the, the pizza, which is why none of the other guys in the room had any. Yeah, I'm no doctor, clearly. But you can't give yourself food poisoning. So there might've been someone else that had to spit on it as well. But interesting. All right. Secondly... The Space Jam Dome, mm. I think, now I'm not sure how much of that was actually uh, filmed and obviously seen, I've seen a little bit of it. Imagine we were sitting here in this pandemic with no sport on watching games from 1996 of dudes just rolling in and Jordan getting himself back in game shape. Then it'd be kind of cool to watch. Now, I have no idea if there's any footage of it, but there could be a little bit of, you know, secondary documentaries on the back of The Last Dance, which I'm going to go back and watch again from the mm. very start. The first ep, if you remember, Liam, got our man Homicide pounding the pavement. Mm. He got out of bed at six How long did that last? <laughs> uh, like four days. <laughs> Body got tired. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hashtag NBL Rewind. It's going to be back Thursday. Chris Ansey is going to join us, in fact, and talk about a Future Forces game that was played in 1995. And you spoke last week and, and gave the idea that Mm. has garnered a fair bit of conversation as well with the Future Forces and the G League and, and possible going forward with, with the young guns joining there. But we had Andrew Gaze on last week and we asked him about, you know, how would you go in 2020? That's been the conversation on the back of how would Jordan go and then flip it back the other way in, in his current day. And it, he was pretty mad at the fact to leave and I that he was like, look, I'd be fairly confident I could do what I could do. Shane Hill would be able to do what he could do. Derek Rucker would dominate the NBL. And Leroy Loggins, and ironically, uh, Showstoppers on Sunday is going to see, uh, and all the NBL channels seeing Leroy drop 54 back in 1986. But got to say, Liam, he was matter of fact that those stars back then, the ones that we are watching and talking to in NBL Rewind, would do the exact same thing in 2020 NBL. He was. Yeah, he said, Larry, give him fits. Um... It's obviously such a hypothetical conversation. Mm-hmm. We'll never be able to see it play out. But I do think there are, there are some guys that could slide in today and, and, and survive and some who could thrive and some that it just wouldn't work out for. So, for instance, you look in the NBA, put MJ in right now, he'd be the best player in the league. No mm-hmm. doubt about it. Put Larry Bird in now. And... I'm not sure he would be as good or as impactful now as he was then. So you talk about those guys that, that Drew is talking about, that those guys are bouncy, fast twitch, athletic guys. Not Drewy, but Leroy and Rucker and um, these types of guys. Hammer will still get his shot off, no doubt about it. Um, but he did make the point, Cam, it's down the other end that would be the big question mark. Because I think there is such a massive focus at the defensive end, especially in the NBL. Such a short season, 28 games, 40 minutes. Every possession is so important that it's every, every game's like a playoff game mm-hmm. and coaches are relentless with their coaching at the defensive end. And, you know, I, that would be the big transition, I think, for a lot of guys. I think uh, when we're talking about the great one, 
he's the great one. He could play in any era and get buckets. Mm-hmm. Uh, Derek Rucker, a stud. He can get buckets right now. Hammer's going to get his. Leroy Loggins has a statue. <laughs> you don't ever doubt any of those names. Anybody else? I don't know. We I don't know because these are the guys that he stated. Yeah. But any man with a statue in front of a venue, he can get buckets anywhere. <laughs> See, I actually agree with what Homicide is saying. And I, and I, I think this translates to all sports. In whatever generation, if you are a superstar, that yeah. translates because of how you got to the top of your game in whatever particular sport it might be, that translates into 2020. We're not picking up Gazy in 89 and having him the exact same way. He would translate to modern medicine. He would be in the gym more. We would see different ways in which they approach their training. So I think it, it's all on a level playing field at that particular time. Now that level playing, it's like Rod Laver in tennis. He's not rocking in the 2020 and playing with a wooden racket. They change with the times. And that's what I like. You're a superstar at that point. Like, you can't just pick Gazy up and go, yeah, well, he would just do what... Like, things are going to change. But I think we'd see... I'm not necessarily saying a dude is going to jump from the foul line, but you would see with modern medicine and, and maybe... That, that, that further complicates the conversation, they can, because we don't know what that guy would look like. We don't know what, what Drew would look like with the, with the kind of strength and conditioning. Would he look like Mitch Creek? I mean, and, do you know what I mean? Also, like, what, what we... What, the conversation for me is the guy we know we saw pick that player up and drop them in, how would they go? Well, but, so you're not, not evolving with the times at all. You're going to play 1989 Andrew Gaze in 2020, which I think is unfair. And yet again, hypothetical conversations. must say my favourite kind of conversations. But then it's like he's going to be a severe disadvantage because you've got players who eat weights for breakfast coming off the bench. You might be able to out-muscle a dude like Andrew Gaze. And that's maybe where defensively it might hurt a little bit, as you touched on mm. last week. Yeah, but that's, I think that's the only way you can have that conversation mm. because we, are, we don't know what, you know, like George no Mikan. Pick, like, what, what would George Mikan be with the strength and conditioning and the modern medicine and all those types of things look like in the modern NBA? We have no idea. You can't yeah, even... George Mikan George Mike played with glasses too, didn't he? Yeah. Yep. So, you know, LASIK, he might be a better shooter. He might lift up his field goal percentage. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. Hey, for someone who's had eyesight issues, I'm telling you, didn't help me. But anyway, you know, one I of think you're right about the superstar element. Like I'm talking I look to superstar those guys from yeah. the nose, and I go, "You pick Derek Rucker, that guy out. Don't change anything about him. Drop him in. He'd be getting buckets. Don't worry about it." Mm-hmm. But you look at a lot of the role players, and you go, he "Wouldn't get on the floor right now." But there's a difference. Yeah, you're right. But the role player was a role player compared to... Like, I'm talking legit superstars. I'm not talking a 1989 seventh man for the Newcastle Falcons who would come in and be an all-NBL second-team player. So I just think it translates well. And I know we complicate the conversation. or I've complicated it by saying, yeah, but they would adapt. But they would adapt. And that's why Larry Bird hit fine ways. Michael Jordan would be a great three-point shooter in 2020 because he's just like, you know what? That's where the game is. I'd just be... I'd add a three-pointer to my game. He'd work his ass off until he got there and end. So, either way. Any mic. Any mic. <laughs> any mic. It's still in the NBA. All right, any mic. NBA over time to get in involved. NBA today. Mm-hmm. What's on for the week, on the side? You got a Rolls Royce to do? You got a sneaker to review? What do you got on? I got nothing going on. Nothing? <laughs> <laughs> Just working in the lab, man. Just working in the lab. See, when he laughs like that, Liam, you just know he's, he's up to something that's going to pop up on Instagram in a couple of days' time. Hey, his wheels are always turning. Don't worry about that. <laughs> I How don't you, sleep, Liam? man. The wheels are definitely turning. I like your style. Hashtag NBL over time to get involved. Something you won't miss is two-way Magne having a chat to Adam Gibson. NBL podcast, that'll drop on Wednesday. NBL Rewind. MVP. Touch on. MVP. MVP of the league. <laughs> Gibbo better ask him. Because no doubt Give that word is called back. If he comes back. What do you reckon is more likely to happen? Him come back or him to win the MVP? Man, that's a good question. Either way, it's a great situation. Look, I'm looking forward to watching this young man continue to do his thing. But I'll tell you this. Bogut gone. K gone. Bryce gone. MVP is open. It's been open. Gone. It's never been as open as it is right now. That's because half the league's not signed to a team. We don't know what's going on. I'm just telling you. 
That what? man got as, a good, as good as a chance as anybody to get that MVP right now. Speaking of Bryce, mm. is Bryce gone? I don't know. <laughs> I I'm sure Bryce is gone. Well, I'll tell you this right now. If Bryce ain't gone, they did the right thing. Stop playing and cut the check for real, for real. Big old check. Yeah. And, 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 um, three out of four championships. It's a, you want me to name the stats again? Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. no Shout out to Bryce. Who's that battle's MVP? We know how good he is. It. <laughs> On that we know Bryce. Hey, oh, shout out to Bryce and the apparel. Appreciate you. Shout hey. out to Bryce. <laughs> Hang on a second. What do you mean the apparel? What happened? Yeah. You know, you know, last season I was hold on, about... hold on. Uh, yeah, Corey got. Some... You didn't get oh. any apparel. Come on, Cam. No, I haven't got any apparel. You know, last season here wearing a last denim season. shirt from 2013, and Bryce Cotton is sending you apparel out. Yes. Remember, I was talking about um. You know, for the MVP voting and all star five voting, like it's time to start. Yeah. Oh. Thing in life. That would look good on me too. You gotta it have is. faith in a dream. That's where it starts. Um, packages. I want a package to arrive on the doorstep saying vote. Shout out to Bryce. One Bryce Cotton. Yeah. Yo, and shout out to the Cottons. Him and his missus. Good looking out. Appreciate you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, get on the Cottons. They're great. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'm getting out of here because I'm going to go and buy my own T-shirt. On that note, all thanks to LD Mobile, NBL Overtime back next week. See ya.